You're listening to Radio Free Aaron on WBAI 99.5 FM in New York. We're joined on the line from Belfast by Henry MacDonald, the Irish correspondent for the Guardian and Observer newspapers, and from Dundalk by Anthony McIntyre, who has his own book out now, uh, Good Friday, The Death of Irish Republicanism, and Anthony, among other things, was an Irish Republican Army volunteer who served 18 years in British prisons. Henry, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. And Henry, you have a new book out, uh, Gunsmoke and Mirrors, a great title, and you talk about how the provisional IRA's struggle is suddenly being redefined, that all the time it was just about giving Catholics equality in the north of Ireland. And yes. That's, uh, and that is now the popular opinion in the media. Well, not only in the media, but g- growing in, in the community as well, even in the community from which the provisional IRA sprang. You're getting children who were maybe just kids, toddlers, at the time of the ceasefires in 1994, growing up and saying things like, uh, you know, Catholics didn't have the vote in the 70s, or um, the IRA struggle was to get Catholics the vote, or, you know, loyalists didn't go to jail, it was only Republicans, things like that. Uh, the whole um, a range of uh, myth-making going on, which is obscuring a basic fact, the basic fact being that the political outcome today, 2008 as we speak, um, is a power sharing executive within the United Kingdom. That is what Sinn Féin has signed up to. And of course, that's a radical departure from what they historically stood for. Well, it's it's, it's 360 degree turn. I mean, it's it's a it's a radical departure from what they set out to do. Indeed, in 1969, when they split the IRA and Sinn Féin, and indeed ridiculed those who went down the political path at that time, and. Um, They've come full circle. They've followed everyone else down the constitutional path. I think that was probably inevitable. What I don't think was inevitable was the death of three and a half thousand people. And that's why I'm I'm minded to write this book, which to set the record straight to say, hold on a minute, three three and a half thousand people didn't die, so so we could have Sunningdale, uh, the political partner and executive, Mark II. And Anthony, in your own book, uh, Good Friday, the Death of Irish Republicanism, would you agree with that? Well, absolutely. You know, Hannay and myself have been, in many ways uh, been predicting the outcome uh, to the, the peace process and uh, have accurately predicted the termination or end of the uh, IRA campaign. So when I hear Henry saying this and when he hears me saying it, now the two of us are surprised. <laughs> and Henry, you talk about the media and you say that this is the popular opinion. You say it's from laziness, that it, you know, it's following the, the 24-9, you know, 24-7 events. Some would say it's something else, that it's a media bias, that the peace process is too important to be damaged by pointing out inconvenient facts. I think there is, I think it's a combination of two things. I think that there is that sense that don't rock the boat. In fact, someone stopped me. I was buying the papers this morning in Belfast, my favorite news, independent news agents, and a guy who works for the Northern Ireland Office, a former member of the Communist Party of Ireland, no less, and now a senior civil servant, pulled up the car and started berating me for the book. He says, what are you doing bringing this, all this stuff up about the past? You know, everybody's moved on, everybody's moved on. And I said, hold on a minute, you know, history is important, and to set the record straight in history is important, and we can't get away from that fact. can't get away from the fact that 3,500 people died. What was it for? What was it all for? Um, as for the media, I think the problem for the media is they don't understand ideology. The key uh, uh, tenet of this book is the change in ideology and the unnoticed change. The, the people that work in the media these days, and in, in, certainly in Northern Ireland, I have observed, are so caught up in the, in the, in the mechanics of, of how, to get, how to get stuff on or how to get stuff on the Internet. They don't step back. They don't stand back and look at it f- from a historic perspective and see how important it is, and I think they've missed it. They've missed the key ideological gear change within republicanism, a very important change, and one that's, in my, in my view, is irreversible. And, and Henry, uh, John McDonough here. Uh, Hello, John. How are you doing? Good, Henry. Uh, you're talking about the myths. I mean, it is being now portrayed that the IRA was the on wing of the civil rights movement. Yes. But when I was up in Derry there uh, uh, for one of the elections when Peggy O'Howe was uh, running. Which I mentioned in the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll have to get it. Uh, 
that uh, when I was there, there was Republicans going around, and this one guy came up to me, and he talked to a 20-year-old who voted Sinn Féin. And he asked her, he said, why did you vote Sinn Féin? She goes, because they're the party that brought peace to Ireland. And it it, it just, it, it like blew me away because they went for 30 years, didn't get what they want. They stopped doing what they were doing. And they're now being credited with bringing peace to Ireland, not even the northern part, to all of Ireland. Mm-hmm. So the, the myth is working. Like wh- whatever you're saying, the youth are picking up on that. And, and they're picking up uh, as Sinn Féin is completely different from, from where they uh, came from, where they were founded. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, there, there are kids now who vote. Well, there are, not, there, are, there are complex reasons for them voting, but, I mean, an awful lot of particularly middle-class kids are voting for um, Sinn Féin because, because they see them as a party of the peace process. There's no doubt about that, and I, I, and I think that will continue. But I would also stress that I think even among the, the, the hardcore cadre vote uh, that was always there, say, in somewhere like West Belfast, I think they will always vote for Sinn Féin too. Um, partly because of, you know they're, they're, they're told what to do, but also I think because they actually yearn for peace. They don't. They like the peace process. I mean, yeah, I'm sure Anthony would agree with me there that there's no constituency within the north of Ireland in Republican readouts, no large and deep constituency that wants to return to any kind of armed struggle. I'd like to hear Anthony's view on that. Anthony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I've been saying it for a long, long time. Uh, that they're you mentioned the armed struggle uh, field, the provisional field. Any group that has come in to try and uh, take over the mantle of armed struggle uh, since the provisionals have made no impact whatsoever. Uh, I think that you mean the Republicans should have made it clear, certainly post OMA, that never again, you know, should the physical force tradition uh, take life, or Republicanism in general take life in pursuit of its goals. So, I, uh, I mean, I agree. Uh, I think, by and large, that you know, Sinn Féin will continue to get the vote because Sinn Féin are a political Catholic party, and the Republicans have now been marginalised. And all those people who uh, just like to see Catholics in power will vote Sinn Féin against Protestants in power, and they'll talk about power sharing when, in fact, they're really voting for his power splitting. Sharing suggests a generosity, and we don't have a generosity here. It's, no. You take this, and we'll take that. So, I mean, but I think another very good book, and I haven't read Henry's book, but I certainly intend to, I think another very good book, which frames the whole matter academically, is a book by Kevin Bean, New Sinn Féin. I just read it. Excellent book. Uh, it's an excellent book, Henry. And he situates the overall provisional defeat uh, within a, a context of uh, the British state having developed strategies within uh, a new European and global context. And basically, Sinn Féin have reduced the identity politics and now have become a junior partner with the British state and the administration of British rule in the north of Ireland. And it's an excellent piece of work. And uh, people who are of an academic bent, I, I think, should read it because it certainly provides major intellectual uh, substance and material to those of us who think about the things maybe not as deeply. I, let me just make one point to you guys, and that is that if, I mean, Anthony got, got, got the sharp end of this more than most people, but if if you say what we're saying, which is the unmentionable, almost if you break the polite fiction that the, the, the conflict in the North ended with a score draw, if you say someone lost and someone won, you're treated almost like a kind of political pedophile or a journalistic pedophile. It's that bad in terms of keeping you off the mainstream airways. I mean, you know, the, I mean, for example, the mainstream BBC haven't, used, haven't mentioned this book, the book that I've written. I don't know uh, what's the case in Anthony's situation. But what I would say, I mean, it's interesting that John's on, on, on the show tonight. I, I'm my, very mindful of that groundbreaking interview he did with Bernadette Sands McEvitt a few years ago when she came on to denounce the process from her viewpoint. And uh, one of the things that prompted me to write my book was the, the anniversary of the hunger strikes. And the way the 25th anniversary was used, not to reflect back on what actually happened so much, but as a kind of a... The, the prisoners were used as kind of... The dead prisoners were used as political props in, in Sinn Féin's election campaign. It was quite stark, the way the whole thing was turned on its head. And there's a very bad book um, edited by Danny Morrison about the hunger strike, a series of essays, and it's, it's a lesson in political propaganda. It is just a book designed to shore up a certain political position. And um, that's what prompted me to write Gunsmoke and Murders. It was, it was that anniversary which sort of distorted what the hunger strike was about and 
started to use the prisoners as kind of a backdrop to an electoral kind of struggle that really was light years away from what they went to jail for.